uh, read an earlier version of the announcement and may have gone to another venue. Uh, but we'll start in about two or three minutes. Uh, so I beg your indulgence. Maybe you can use the time to get some, some refreshments and we'll start in about three minutes. This, that was not a call to silence. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, perhaps we can begin. Uh, I, uh, my name is Lubomir Haida, by the way, for those of you who may not know me, uh, from the Ukrainian Research Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to this special session of the Ukraine Study Group uh, on behalf both of the Ukrainian Research Institute and the co-sponsor of this event, the uh, Davis Center. Uh, it's a real difficulty for me to introduce our speaker. There's so much to say and so little time. Uh, so forgive me if I do not do full justice to the uh, biography. Uh, the, you will see that my difficulty begins with his educational background because in addition to his undergraduate work, uh, Andreas Umland also has uh, specialized certificates and I'm not quite sure if it's three masters and two doctorates or two masters and three doctorates. <laughs> but, and from uh, non, no uh, lesser institutions than uh, Leipzig, uh, Stanford, University of Oxford, the Free University of Berlin, and Cambridge. No mean feat, I think, for most of us. Uh, he has been associated in various research capacities and teaching capacities uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, uh, our own Harvard's Weatherhead Center, so he is not actually um, uh, just a pioneer arriving for the first time to Harvard. Uh, he's lectured uh, at, uh, in Yekaterinburg. He's been associated with Kiev Mohila Academy since the late 90s, I believe, like, or early 2000s. It's been a while in any case. Uh, St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and Kiev's other major university, the Kiev Shevchenko University. Uh, and a smaller university you may not have heard of, but in which, which does some very interesting work, in which he is uh, academic advisor, the Catholic University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt. Uh, his work has been uh, devoted to the post-Soviet history of uh, Russia and Ukraine. He works both as a historian and a political scientist. I would say mar marries the two disciplines in a very original way. Uh, his uh, particular interests have focused on questions of nationalism, uh, radicalism, especially radicalism of the right. He's written and published on uh, neo-Eurasianism and Mr. Dugin, with whom you're familiar. Uh, the Orange Revolution, fascism, past and present, and many other similar topics. Um, as I said at the beginning, one could go on, but time is too short, and I think we would all rather hear our speaker present his own uh, words rather than hear me talking about 
him uh, the topic that he is uh, going to address today is the six futures of Ukraine competing scenarios for a European pivot state. So, Andreas, please. If you want my contact data, maybe I'll give around. I have made a few uh, business cards. Um, you may have seen already um, uh, the text of this uh, presentation in one way or another. Um, I published it uh, before here, for instance, in the Harvard International Review, a longer version in the Brown Journal of International Affairs. And I've also given already this paper several times, and it's also on um, on YouTube and on Facebook, um, these presentations. And I'm, I keep continuing uh, presenting this because this is not a typical paper, um, a typical academic paper with a hypothesis or question, uh, empirical evidence, and then, a que then an answer to the question or a falsification or verification of um, the hypothesis. But these are, in, in fact, um, uh, outlines of um, six, six hypothetical pu uh, futures, uh, which um, uh, you know, which which do not get, give, uh, and these outlines do not give any answers really. And I'm myself in the search uh, for for an answer, and I've um, for myself, it, it has become just uh, quite useful to to present this paper uh, again and, and again because it helps me my, my, helps myself to understand better what. What the um, likely futures is the um, the desirable futures for Ukraine are, and um, what maybe to recommend and what to write, write in the future. Um, so this is not an analytical, but rather a synthetic um, presentation. It's it's not retrospective, but speculative. It's not explanatory, but explorative. And um, I will outline here six uh, possible uh, security scenarios uh, for Ukraine. Um, I'll just um, <clears throat> maybe name them and then later on explain them. The first one is called the gray zone scenario, a continuation of the current um, situation. The second, a grand bargain. The third, um, NATO membership. The fourth, uh, EU accession. The fifth, uh, major non-NATO ally of the US. And the sixth, um, I call intermarium, and I'll explain later what that means. And um, the reason that I'm outlining this is that I also want to find out whether there might be more scenarios for Ukraine's security future and um, how one could perhaps uh, rank uh, these futures in, in terms of their uh, desirability and feasibility and which policy recommendations would come out of this. Um, so far, I have to say, um, I've, I've thought a lot about these other options for Ukraine and uh, whether there might be um, uh, possible other uh, options, whether there might be a seventh, eighth, or ninth scenario. But so far, and maybe maybe in the discussion, uh, you bring up something um, uh, else. Um, I found that most of the alternatives that I can think of, at least, are either unlikely or can be subsumed under the six um, scenarios I'm going to outline or that they provide no solution to the, or uh, that they do not really address the issue of um, Ukraine's future security. So um, my presentation is exclusively about the foreign affairs of Ukraine, and um, there would be many who would say that this is not, uh, not a serious approach, that one should also f focus on domestic affairs, on, uh, on the reform agenda, and um, I certainly would acknowledge that Ukraine has uh, lots of uh, things domestically to do to, um, uh, to secure its future. Um, uh, I've, I've criticized also in other papers and, and, and articles um, uh, Ukrainian current domestic affairs to such a degree that a prominent um, a scholar in Ukrainian studies, Taras Kuzio, has repeatedly asked in public the director of my institute to fire me from uh, from my institute because my um, my comments were in his um, uh, on domestic affairs Ukrainian domestic affairs were in his opinion and Kuzio's opinion uh, inappropriate. Um, so there are a lot of things to say to say about um, the uh, paternalistic, uh, as I would call it, um, um, referring to Henry Hale's book Paternal Politics about post-Soviet affairs uh, on the paternalistic regime. Of, uh, of Ukraine and that it has not yet been overcome. But I would um, uh, argue that um, the structure of Ukrainian domestic affairs has changed after the Euromaidan revolution to a degree 
that I would say that um, if you just uh, would just or could just take out um, the domestic um, situation in uh, in Ukraine, then um, the country is basically with all its problems um, on the right uh, track, and that is above all because what has been uh, labeled by by other authors and by myself before as the um, the sandwich uh, mechanism of um, implementing reforms in Ukraine which refers to the fact that uh, the implementation of reforms after the Euromaidan uh, revolution has been not so much uh, an, a result of political activity and of um, uh, po political competition and, and infighting, but rather of a combined pressure between um, a still mobilized and uh, continuously mobilized civil society on the one hand, local Ukrainian civil society, and on the other hand of um, powerful donor organizations, above all the um, International Monetary Fund and the European Union, which have um, um, combined their forces and are closely cooperating in Kiev to push through uh, reforms, um, uh, uh, the legislative part and also the, the um, then implementation of the reforms. And this has been called their, their um, uh, their cooperation and combined pressure on on the uh, Ukrainian um, current uh, government has been called a sandwich sort of mechanism of uh, implementing these uh, these reforms. Um, and this has been also partly not only a result of the Euromaidan, but also already of the Orange Revolution, as is going to be outlined in a in an electronic book that is um, forthcoming with Ponars, a Washington D.C. program on. Uh, on Eurasia, um, and uh, one of the author, one of the three authors is Graham Robertson, where they outline this whole sandwich, um, sandwich issue about the Ukrainian reforms and the and the uh, mobilization of Ukrainian civil society. Um, that is what I wanted to add. Was also largely a result of the um, of the dismay among Ukrainian civil society activists. I, I live in Ukraine since 2002. I know my, many of them personally. Um, after the Orange Revolution and the, basically the failure, one could argue, of the Orange Revolution. And uh, this is now an explana explanation for its continued uh, mobilization and this combination of forces with uh, the donor organizations that apply this conditionality um, mechanism. I would add to the, to the forthcoming book um, uh, that um, is soon going to be out electronically that there were also other factors that have changed after the Euromaidan um, the um, uh, not only those donor organizations that apply conditionality me mechanisms have increased their activity um, in Ukraine, uh, I mean the IMF and the EU, partly the World Bank, but also international civil society such as the, um, uh, the um, Ukrainian uh, branch of the uh, Soros Foundation called in Ukraine the International Renaissance Foundation, Transparency International, the German political foundations, um, uh, the IRI, the NDI, and so on, they have also increased, I, as, as I perceive it, at least their activity significantly after the Euromaidan. Um, a fourth factor, I think, that is also uh, sort of um, securing uh, the success of, um, or at least long-term success of the reforms are the increased um, activities of international developmental organizations that do not apply conditionality me mechanisms to the same degree as the IMF and, and the EU. And here I mean above all uh, such um, organizations as USAID or the GIZ, um, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, uh, but also others from, from Sweden, from uh, Switzerland, Britain, and so on that um, help, for instance, with the implementation of the decentralization reform. Also, uh, in my perception, uh, the um, activities of the Ukrainian diaspora uh, of emigres in Ukraine and for Ukraine has increased greatly. Graduates from Western universities have returned to Ukraine and taken up positions partly in the government, but also in civil society. Uh, and even the war in the, in the Donbas, um, which has, of course, um, to a large degree negative um, um, repercussions on the domestic situation, also uh, creates, I would say, um, sometimes um, pressures and uh, incentives, um, uh, I would say, that um, 
um, that are um, uh, advancing reforms rather than hindering them. But I won't go now here into the um, details of that. Um, I think also that the um, eventually the um, the re successful reform of Ukraine will also be probably the path um, um, that Ukraine will have to take in returning um, the um, uh, perhaps perhaps even the, the the occupied territories in the Donetsk basin, but probably also of Crimea. That uh, at the end of the day, maybe something like. Um, uh, the uh, reunification of Germany um, would, may happen in uh, uh, with Ukraine and, and Crimea as well after Ukraine has become a, um, uh, suffic sufficiently act attractive and uh, increased its capacity as a state and as an um, economy. Um, so the um, um, I will I will not go here also in in much detail about the uh, the, the Donbas and Crimea issues because um, although you know strategically I think the uh, a successful Ukraine is necessary for these uh, for these things to to resolve um, they are largely functions of domestic Russian developments um, uh, partly also of Western sanctions policies uh, and uh, in Crimea maybe. Uh, actually, a return of this territory may only happen after some sort of regime change in um, in, um, in in Russia. So uh, uh, another issue that I will also not and now I'm I'm closing uh, slowly the caveats um, that I'm making at the beginning here that I will also not deal with here extensively are the non-military security issues. Uh, some people would argue that um, they are actually more important than the purely military security issues. Uh, cyber, uh, psychological warfare, intelligence, um, secret service actions, all sorts of um, uh, non-military uh, forms of, uh, of warfare. I will deal here mainly with the um, issue of uh, military security, which I think is um, not only by itself important, but um, it's also very important in terms of the um, of the perception of Ukraine in both uh, inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine in the West and um, in, in Russia. Um, yes, yeah, so um, uh, the, uh, the security issue I think is so crucial here for, for Ukraine because it, it basically conditions uh, the uh, domestic reforms and it, uh, it, it is I think the major factor that will um, uh, determine the future of the Ukrainian um, uh, state. Um, it's not just in terms of, of the substance of security so important for Ukraine, but also um, an issue that um, hinders the Ukrainian state and especially Ukrainian civil society um, to concentrate on domestic affairs, to uh, fully devote itself to the, to the reforms that were sort of signaled with the Euromaidan um, um, uprising and it is also um, an important issue for um, the cooperation of Ukraine the uh, uh, the general security situation the international security situation is important for Ukraine's cooperation with the West for instance um, for the perception in the West among uh, Western potential Western uh, investors in uh, in Ukraine so often when uh, when one discusses the the um, the uh, the low Western direct investment or, or absence, uh, partly even of it in, um, especially in southern and eastern Ukraine, the argument is that the um, Ukrainian state is, of course, in such a uh, situation and such a, um, a state, uh, such a uh, bad uh, situation right now that this hinders the um, foreign direct investment. There's corruption, oligarchy. Uh, lack of, rule, uh, of the um, rule of law, uh, but I think the um, um, what ap often happens here when one discusses this in in Kiev, especially with um, with diplomats, with uh, with experts, and with um, uh, representatives of businesses, that there is a um, um, and I don't know whether you are here in uh, in methodology seminars. That there's a selection bias on the dependent variable here. That the um, um, that the um, opinion that the polls that often are taken about the um, hindrances for foreign direct investment in Ukraine are largely taken among 
businesses that are already in Ukraine and um, that uh, where the business people then uh, are primarily concerned not so much with the security situation and with the war in the Donbas, but more concerned about corruption and um, uh, a lack of rule of law. Um, the odd thing about uh, this whole story is, however, um, uh, actually there are three odd things about um, uh, this, uh, this story is, first, that there was much more foreign direct investment before the Euromaidan and the start of the war and the uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict, um, which would then, according to the logic that is then often applied, mean that there was perhaps less corruption under Yanukovych, um, or that um, there is more foreign direct investment in Western Ukraine, oddly, than in Eastern and Southern Ukraine, although these are the major, uh, these are more important, industrially more important uh, regions of Ukraine. And also that there is much more uh, foreign direct investment in other rather similarly com corrupt post-Soviet states, uh, above all uh, in Russia. And what here often happens is, I think, uh, and now I'm coming back to this methodological error, is that um, the, uh, the polls that are taken taking among business people are only taken about, among those business people that have already come to Ukraine and that have sort of already um, overcome this perception of a, of a, um, of a country uh, that has an unresolved security issue that is at war. Um, and uh, the polls are not taken among potential investors that have not yet come to Ukraine. Uh, and, that it's, and that's the, as I would call it, a selection bias on the dependent variable here. So um, uh, I think the security is therefore a crucial issue, not only for, uh, for purely state building, um, uh, narrowly understood state building issues, but also for the uh, development of, uh, of the economy of Ukraine. And also there are, um, and that's now my final uh, introductory remark, um, there is the, the larger, I think, underestimated um, danger of a major new escalation of the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict. For instance, I have, I have myself made a, quite a few enemies in, in Ukraine by writing um, up such an apocalyptic scenario <clears throat> for the case that the infamous Kerch br Bridge um, that is built between the Russian Federation and the Kerch Peninsula, which is a part of the of the um, um, Crimean Peninsula. Uh, if this uh, bridge, which is a major engineering undertaking, will not be built, will not function well, or will not actually resolve the um, infrastructural deficiencies that now sort of the Crimea pr project in a way has. So if, if this catch bridge somehow turns out to be, for whatever reason, uh, not successful, and if it will not um, significantly improve the economic development of, um, of Crimea, then uh, I, I have indeed the fear that Russia may risk that there might be uh, people in the Kremlin who would think that uh, the success of the Crimea project is so important to the survival of the Putin regime that um, it might be worth taking the risk to create a land connection between Russia and Crimea. And if you know the map a little bit, that is, um, um, that is about 500 kilometers between the uh, uh, Russian part of the Donetsk Basin and uh, Crimea. That would be a major war uh, between, uh, much larger than the one we, we had so far, um, along the shores of the Azov Sea. And by the way, in the, in the vicinity of the largest um, nuclear power plant, not only in Ukraine, but the largest nu European nuclear power plant in, in, um, in Saporizhia. So this would be a, a, a rather apocalyptic indeed development. But um, because of the, um, the importance of the Crimea project for, for the Kremlin and for Putin, and we've just seen that, that the presidential elections have been moved to the um, to the date of the to the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea on 18th of March uh, 2014 and now they are um, on the 18th of March 2018 these presidential elections because of the importance of this project um, uh, I wouldn't exclude this uh, rather um, uh, 
that scenario for everybody. So the uh, I think the uh, now to the six scenarios. Um, um, uh, I think they 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 are pretty pretty easy to understand, um, uh, but they have um, uh, they are maybe more more complicated actually in their with their implications. The most obvious one, and I think the by far most likely one, is the continuation of the current gray zone scenario of the of this uh, situation in which Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia found themselves after the uh, enlargement of NATO and um, the uh, formation of the Russian-dominated bloc uh, of the um, uh, expressed by the Tashkent Treaty, the um, organization for, of the Treaty for Collective Security and the Eurasian Economic Union. These three countries uh, have found themselves, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, between um, the EU and NATO on the one side and um, uh, and, and the Russia dominated organizations on, on the other side. Um, so um, in a way one could argue that this is the only future actually one should discuss about because the other ones, the other five that I, list, that I uh, quickly uh, named at the beginning and that I'm going to outline um, are all um, all Im imply a, a major new treaty uh, that would restructure the geopolitics of Eastern Europe. Um, none of these treaties is very likely um, so far, and therefore this gray zone scenario, as I would call it, is it um, uh, is is uh, is the by far most likely. It is also um, maybe to the surprise of some some of you. Uh, um, a rather popular uh, scenario, um, even within Ukraine, where there are many people who say Ukraine has to solve itself uh, its security problems. Uh, Ukraine has to be, become a um, self-sufficient nation. It uh, should not should be, as, as some nationalists have have told me at a presentation like this uh, at Shevchenko University in in Kiev. Uh, Ukraine should become a subject of international relations and not an object of international relations, and uh, and should uh, um, uh, uh, should not even seek a, a major a new international treaty that would somehow protect it. Um, I think that is a uh, that is an idle dream. Ukraine will uh, will not be able to become by itself strong enough to resist a, a new Russian uh, advance, um, as the one I outlined. Um, uh, concerning um, uh, the uh, concerning Crimea, um, um, and uh, this is not uh, not possible. So the, um, um, uh, the 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 counter um, uh, the counter argument that is sometimes made here is that well, you cannot expect the um, um, the West to take ma a major risk uh, of. Um, uh, of going into some sort of uh, larger engagement with Ukraine because this is just not how international relations work. The the problem I, as that I see with that here is that um, this is exactly what the Kremlin knows. Uh, this is exactly um, the calculation that is behind the current strategy of the um, of the Kremlin that it would um, conduct this low intensity warfare. Um, against Ukraine that it would scare away foreign investors, uh, young people. Um, it would um, uh, sort of keep Ukraine in this limbo state where um, uh, no economic, major economic development um, is, uh, is possible. And then I think the, uh, as the years go by, actually um, a breakup and of Ukraine that uh, Russia has been taking, has, has been, uh, the, well, the Russian representatives have been talking about so much will actually become more likely because that if the country uh, continues to to remain in this depressive state for for many years I think uh, then it will indeed be very difficult to, to hold um, the state together and then the the um, uh, the the scenario that uh, uh, of a breakup in, indeed becomes um, uh, becomes more likely. Um, also, the uh, another argument that is often made is that uh, Russia wouldn't be able to occupy Ukraine, and um, um, and this is just a, a ridiculous, you know, think, um, uh, you know, apocalyptic scenario to to think about. Russia doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have 
a large enough army, there would be partisan warfare against the Russian occupation force, and so on. But the, um, but the problem that I see with that is that maybe it may not be in the interest of Russia to occupy large parts of Ukraine. Maybe a corridor that connects the Donbas with, the, with Crimea, but um, it might be sufficient with an attack just to, um, to uh, on Ukraine that would not involve occupation to reach the strategic goals that um, that the Kremlin has, namely to prevent uh, the emergence of a Eastern uh, of a counter model of socio-economic um, and political development in an Eastern Slavic Orthodox uh, brother nation, as um, as it was uh, once called. So um, the occupation may no, a large scale occupation of Ukraine by Russia may not be actually um, a strategic aim of of, uh, of uh, Russia, but just the breakup and the and the failure of Ukraine as a state may be the aim itself, and uh, um, and therefore the the whole argument about uh, the lacking capacity of Russia to um, to occupy Ukraine is, I think, also uh, um, of the point. So this is, I think, the um, um, the most likely scenario. It's not a very good scenario. It's basically the, the scenario that got us to the situation we are in today. But um, this is the the line of thinking that uh, most uh, politicians are in, and uh, and most would would stop now, you know, and and and, and say that you know all considering all other options is is just uh, plain fantasy. Uh, but as I, as I said, the, um, this may be exactly the calculation that um, the Kremlin has in mind, that um, this gray zone will keep Ukraine in, the, in a limbo situation in which it will not be able to um, develop successfully and then uh, would break up by itself. The most popular, now come, I come to the second scenario, um, um, the most popular scenario in the West, um, as far as I can say, at least in Germany, is that of a grand bargain between um, the West and Russia, and maybe Ukraine included or not. And um, the, um, uh, the title under which this has become uh, known in Germany, this uh, concept is that of a plural peace. Uh, by plural peace, what is meant is that this would not be a liberal peace. That would not be a peace in which such principles as the um, sovereignty of nations, um, the, uh, the rule of international law um, would be observed, but that there would be also other principles like this, the idea of spheres of influence that would be um, uh, part of this peace, of this peace arrangement uh, between Russia and, uh, and the West. And the proposal that uh, two German political scientists have made here is um, that the West should seek an, uh, a peace or an arrangement with, uh, with uh, Russia that would permanently exclude Ukraine from the European Union and from NATO. And that would be then an infringement upon the sovereignty of the Ukrainian state and the principles of international law, the Paris Charter, um, and so on, and, and many other uh, international documents. It would not be a liberal peace. It would be a plural peace, because it would also acknowledge um, other principles, uh, uh, neo-imperial principles, one could say, um, for, for coming to such, a, such an accommodation. But the, but the argument that would, would, would be behind this here is that peace is so important that we should be ready to, um, to sacrifice these principles of a, of a liberal international order. The problem that I see with this year is not only, and not so much, in fact, a moral uh, one or uh, an ethical one, but that um, this would also not only be uh, a problem for, for Ukraine, uh, which, for instance, what with regard to European integration has a long history uh, of um, aspiring um, EU membership perspective and uh, um, accession negotiations and, um, and entry into, in, into the EU. Um, uh, in fact, there are already resolutions of the there have been there were already resolutions of the Verkhovna Rada when the Soviet Union already existed in 1990 and 1991 
in which the Verkhovna Rada, the parliament of Ukraine, asks the uh, government of Ukraine to secure um, Ukraine's participation in in the European integration process and the um, uh, the aim of uh, EU membership has been uh, officially um, uh, has been an official aim of the Ukrainian state since 1998. Not only this would then be um, uh, trampled upon, but also the uh, some documents of the European Union and of NATO would have to be uh, discarded. Uh, namely Article 49 of the uh, Treaty on European Union, which says that every European country has the right to apply for EU membership, or the 2008 um, Bucharest Declaration of NATO, in which NATO declared that Georgia and Ukraine will become members of NATO without saying how and when. And these would have to be, these uh, documents would have to be discarded. The other problem with this uh, grand bargain idea, and uh, there are also some American uh, scholars here. I'm, I, have, I haven't, I'm not just, as there's a, there's a scholar at Brookings Institution who has made a somewhat similar proposal. I think Henry Kissinger has also um, spoken um, in, uh, in this direction and others as well. The other problem with this sort of uh, grand bargain is that we had already a, com uh, a whole uh, array of multilateral arrangements and treaties with uh, with um, uh, where where Russia was involved that where the West was involved and where um, post-soviet state were states were involved and that uh, you, um, Russia has uh, uh, has uh, then discarded all the partly Russia oddly was uh, was uh, not only a signatory of these um, of these documents but even had even, uh, participated in formulating these uh, documents. Uh, the, the most famous one, which I will um, later uh, talk about um, at the end, talk a, li a little bit more about, is the uh, Budapest Memorandum of 1994 um, of um, Russia, the US, Great Britain, and, um, uh, and Ukraine in connection with Ukraine's um, uh, uh, Ukraine's readiness to, to get rid of its uh, nuclear weapons, or the 1999 OSCE um, document, which in which uh, uh, which uh, Russia signed as an OSCE member uh, and declared its um, its uh, readiness to withdraw its troops from Transnistria. The 2008 so-called Sarkozy plan, the uh, Russian-Georgian uh, peace treaty. Um, negotiated with uh, with the um, then president um, uh, of the European Union um, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy the French president which then represented the uh, the European Union where Russia um, uh, signed a, a document uh, in which it uh, which said that it would withdraw its troops from uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia the 2014 Geneva declaration and the 2014 and 2015 Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 um, uh, uh, agreements. So um, the the problem with the grand bargain is that we we may be able to sign a new um, a new declaration or treaty or um, or memorandum or protocol or whatever with Russia, but that this document would have the same fate as other older documents that uh, bilateral and multilateral that Russia has treated and partly uh, itself uh, formulated. Um, and then later uh, discarded. The um, the one uh, exception I would make here of this sort of uh, of an arrangement with Russia, um, with the current Russian regime, would be a UN peacekeeping uh, mission for the Donbas. I will not go here into this. I've, I've published with a colleague before that already in 2016 about this. Um, but I will not. Um, but I, I think there's sometimes a, a misunderstanding here that this would somehow solve the the uh, security situation of, of Ukraine. I think it, it it could be an instrument, maybe to have um, um, to come to a solution of the uh, of the Donbas problem, and it would depend, of course, on the on the um, on the sanctions regime that the West um, is uh, is currently um, upholding, and whether it will be upheld, and then maybe Russia may be ready to. Uh, such a uh, face-saving um, uh, opera uh, UN peacekeeping uh, operation but in any way this would be only a temporary operation it would not be a, a permanent presence of UN of a large UN peacekeeping force in the Donbas so it would not be a principal solution 
of the gray zone problem that um, uh, that Ukraine has. But we can discuss about the UN peacekeeping issue uh, later on. I'm, I'm just not dealing with uh, with it here because the UN is simply not an, an organization that will solve Ukraine's um, uh, security issue. In Ukraine, the third um, um, scenario that I want to introduce here is um, the, the most popular, which is accession to NATO, uh, full membership in NATO. The same goes basically for Georgia. Um, and it is not out of the air. Uh, as I mentioned already, the uh, 2008 Bucharest Declaration says that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of, of NATO. Um, there are also now, not only in Georgia, but also in, in Ukraine, uh, um, relatively stable um, um, majorities or at least pluralities of uh, of the population that are in favor of, uh, of NATO accession. That has, uh, by the way, changed in, in principle, uh, of course, in, in Ukraine since uh, the beginning of the war in, in, in the Donbas. There's also surprisingly, there was in 2017 um, um, uh, uh, an opinion poll in, in the UK, Germany, France, Italy, Lithuania, Poland, and the Netherlands and uh, um, about uh, Ukraine's accession to um, to NATO and 58 percent of the of the uh, people polled in these uh, um, seven countries uh, actually said that Ukraine should become a, a NATO member. Nevertheless, I think the uh, unfortunately, and uh, I've made this argument before. Stephen Pfeiffer has has also written about this on the website of Brookings in, uh, of the Brookings Institution. I think this is not um, uh, it, 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 it's it's technically it, it would be possible perhaps in a couple of years when Ukraine has introduced uh, NATO standards in its uh, or completed its introduction of NATO standards in its army. But I think politically, it's not a feasible, um, uh, a feasible um, uh, step for for Ukraine and Georgia right now. The paradox of this uh, is that um, probably Georgia and Ukraine will only become NATO members when they will not any longer need that NATO membership that much anymore, because um, you, you need in the North Atlantic Council, which is the um, the, the major organ of, of NATO, a full consensus of all now 29 member states of, of NATO to an accession of a country. And as I see it, there would be always at least a couple of West European nations that would vote against an accession of Georgia and Ukraine to NATO as long as they have their conflicts, their territorial conflicts with, um, with Russia. And therefore, I think um, as, as popular as it is, and I've, I've, I've criticized this as, as well, and, this, and a deputy prime minister has has attacked me for, for writing that Ukraine will not become a, a NATO <laughs> member um, 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 as in a period in which it would need it, actually, NATO member. I'm, I'm clear, I would clearly be myself for, I think for me, it's also the most popular, I would say, um, uh, scenario, but I think it's it's extremely unlikely that NATO will agree to to include either um, um, Ukraine or Georgia into NATO as long as they have their um, conflicts with Russia, because simply the the, um, the stakes are so high. Maybe there could be. Um, I could imagine that the U.S. and and uh, and Canada, as well as some East European nations, would, in a hypothetical voting in the North Atlantic Council, be in favor of uh, NATO accession for Georgia and and Ukraine. But as I said, there would be at least some West European nations, my own home country, Germany, perhaps among them, that would vote against um, uh, this. And therefore, I think um, actually the, um, the discussion about NATO membership, um, as I see it now uh, in Ukraine, is partly simply a distraction. And it's unproductive because it, it distracts people from thinking about alternatives to NATO membership for the period when it will finally become possible. At the end, I think you, both Ukraine and Georgia will become members. Moldova has this declared itself permanently block-free in 1994. Uh, by the way, the same year in which Moldova concluded a treaty with, with Russia about the withdrawal of Russian troops from Transnistria, Moldova declared itself permanently block-free. 
but the Russian troops are still in Transnistria. So this is, you know, this is also about the grand bargain. You know, you make a nice treaty with Russia, you declare yourself NATO bloc free, you know, you have this sort of deal, and then, you know, the deal doesn't happen. Uh, um, 24 years later, we, we're still, uh, the, the troops after this treaty are still, um, are still there. I think the most underestimated uh, solution of the um, security situation and not seriously enough discussed uh, issue is the fourth scenario is the accession of Ukraine to the European Union. Uh, to many, um, uh, this is a sort of, uh, you know, it's not a, it's, it's too far away and it's, um, uh, it's something that is uh, sort of almost out of the fantastic. Um, uh, but in fact, I think um, once it will become possible that Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova are ready for EU accession, they will actually become members of the EU. And when they become members of the EU, basically this would be almost as good as NATO membership in terms of their security situation. And that is not only because of um, the Article 42.7 of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which has basically transformed uh, the European Union into a defense union, uh, which gives security guarantees to the members of the European Union that are similar to the Article 5 of the Washington Treaty of NATO. It obliges this, this article, each member of the European Union, to come to the help of each other uh, of, of any other member of the uh, European Union attacked. Um, the, um, the underestimation, I think, here comes from the fact that accession to the European Union, I think, is a much more geopolitically loaded, um, would be a much more geopolitically loaded step than accession of Georgia and Ukraine to NATO. And the difference here is that the US is not a member of the um, uh, European Union, in a couple of years, the European Union will only have one nuclear country among its members, France. Uh, currently, it's still uh, Britain as well, or maybe if they, if they exit Brexit, maybe, maybe they, they'll stand in. But anyway, the US is not part of it. And also, the, the whole identity and the functioning of the European Union, although it is now de facto a defense union, is not that of a military alliance. It is not, um, you know, the European Union is not a, a, an organization that is good in applying hard power. It works through soft power, th through economic sanctions at most, uh, but not uh, through uh, uh, military action. And uh, uh, the reason why I think uh, this is underestimated um, is that most people don't understand the. Uh, the ex exceptional uh, character of the association agreement that uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Mo uh, Moldova, the agreements that they have signed with the European Union that are actually, I think, misnamed. Um, the, the title association agreement is a misnomer for these treaties because they de facto prepare these countries for EU membership. These are association agreements that are very different from the many other association agreements that the European Union has with many countries around the world. Um, the, uh, these are much larger treaties that make uh, Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova de facto, um, in the course of the implementation of, their, of these treaties, parts of the economic and legal sphere of the um, uh, European Union. They Europeanize, that is a technical term, um, that is used in political science for the um, implementation and for the incorporation of the so-called acquis communautaire, the, the the laws and regulations of the European Union in the in the domestic um, legislation of, of countries. Uh, the association agreements presume uh, agreements presume that these three countries will uh, implement um, incorporate the acquis communautaire in their domestic. Um, legislation and once this this process has once these countries have been through these process i think the european union although it now does not give these countries a membership perspective will have no other choice than actually to uh, to to take them in and to start membership negotiations and once these membership negotiations have started 
I would also predict the, uh, they will be relatively short because many, many of the issues that usually um, new members of the or aspiring members of the European Union have to resolve during the negotiation process will have been already resolved during the association process that is currently um, going on without the membership um, uh, perspective. And uh, the, the reason why I think this would be um, a solution uh, almost as, as, as valuable for Ukraine's security si situation um, as NATO membership is because of the enormous economic leverage that the European Union has and the, um, that the very, uh, still very strong ties, economic ties between Russia and the European Union, and in the moment that um, Ukraine, and the same goes for Georgia and Moldova, would become members of the European Union, they could also claim um, uh, this, uh, that this economic leverage uh, would be uh, uh, used uh, uh, then in, in securing their, uh, their sovereignty against, um, against Russia. But we can talk about uh, about this more maybe maybe in the discussion. Now to the to the fifth scenario, um, uh, which is uh, maybe uh, the least known, uh, uh, but uh, in a way would be the um, uh, the easiest thing to do uh, because it would involve not not many countries. Um, it's the major non-NATO ally status um, for Ukraine, uh, which is a special. Um, scheme that uh, the U.S. is providing for certain partner countries across the world that are not members of, um, of NATO. Uh, the prototypical uh, case here is the uh, security treaty between the U.S. and South Korea from 1953. Um, in 2014, in the Euro Ukraine Freedom Support Act, uh, the um, uh, major non-NATO ally status was actually uh, in the a part of the draft for this uh, U.S. law, but it was in the 11th hour taken out of this uh, of this law, which was then adopted in t December 2014. Um, this could be become possible uh, at some point, not so much because the um, um, because um, the U.S. Um, will have so much sympathy for, for Ukraine, but because of another story that I've already indicated at the beginning, and um, Mariana Bujerin has, has written about this here much more, and this is the whole issue about um, uh, Ukraine uh, having been, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the third largest nuclear weapons state of the world. It has uh, uh, had a... a inherited from the Soviet Union a huge arsenal of, uh, uh, of nuclear weapons and then has uh, uh, decided to become a nuclear weapons free state. There's a discussion about how much uh, of this, um, whether Ukraine could have become a nuclear weapons state, uh, uh, probably not, uh, not a, a full-scale uh, um, nuclear power with, uh, uh, with strategic nuclear weapons, but perhaps from this huge arsenal that uh, Ukraine had inherited from the Soviet Union. It could have um, kept a small tactical nuclear force that would have changed um, its status. The, um, however, because of a variety of reasons, uh, because of the Chernobyl disaster among, uh, of 1986, among others, uh, Ukraine decided then to uh, not keep any of its uh, nuclear material, weapons, uh, facilities, and so on, to get rid of all of that also under pressure from both Russia and uh, the West. And um, it has then, and it signed not only the, um, um, uh, the non-proliferation treaty, um, uh, the uh, treaty um, uh, against no pro proliferation of nuclear uh, weapons, but it also uh, signed with the uh, depository states, the three depository states of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty um, Britain, um, the U.S., and Russia, the already mentioned Budapest Memorandum at a um, summit of the then still Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, in Budapest in December 1994. And the uh, important thing here, um, and that's where I come back now to um, that maybe your yeah, sympathy for Ukraine may not be as important here for um, some sort of agreement between the U.S. and, and Ukraine, maybe even including Great Britain, 
uh, maybe not sympathy for Ukraine here is so important, uh, but um, the fact that uh, Russia has with its attack uh, on um, uh, Ukraine um, sort of uh, turned the logic of the um, non-proliferation regime on its head. Um, the uh, idea of the non-proliferation regime is that you have uh, certain five countries that are also the um, uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council that are under the non-proliferation treaty official uh, nuclear weapon states, but um, that they would have special obligations. And the other countries, they would be non-nuclear weapon states, and then they would be under protection uh, uh, through this treaty. Um, um, uh, they, are, uh, they would agree not to have, not to develop, not to acquire nuclear weapons, but still be secure um, as signatories of this, um, of this treaty. And here we have actually the, the whole thing turned on its head, that, the, that a, an official nuclear power under the non-proliferation treaty attacks an official non-nuclear power under the non-proliferation treaty. And moreover, this non-nuclear power was once the third largest nuclear weapon state of the, of the world. And that, you know, that undermines basically the whole logic of this, of, this, of this treaty. And so what I could imagine that maybe once this, uh, once this, this problem now for the whole non-proliferation regime, for the, log for the logic of it becomes sort of better understood in, in, in the US and in the world maybe, that at some point um, the US and maybe even Britain would agree to upgrade the Budapest Memorandum and, and to say that we are not just giving security assurances, but we are giving actually the security guarantees uh, to Ukraine that, uh, that Ukraine wants. Uh, and um, that because, because then this would strengthen the non-proliferation -prolifer regime that would again sort of strengthen the logic of this entire uh, non-proliferation uh, treaty. The odd thing about this is a major beneficiary of such an upgrading of the Budapest Memorandum would be no other country than Russia. Because I think Russia's superpower status is more than, uh, is, is grounded on its, uh, on having uh, this exclusive right along with the other four official nuclear uh, countries of uh, being having the permission to have nuclear weapons is much more built on this privilege that Russia has. So China, the US, Britain, and France, they have also other sources that determine their world power status, economic power, ac academia, science, research, and so on. Um, but Russia's superpower status is much more built on it uh, having, um, having nuclear weapons. And of course, then, if you have more countries that would acquire nuclear weapons because they would not believe in the non-proliferation treaty anymore, then the relative power, oddly, of Russia would sink more than that of the other official nuclear weapon states because Russia has not as strong as an e uh, economy or as strong as research capacity as as the four other official nuclear weapon states. And finally, the, uh, the last scenario, um, maybe also not very well known, is the intermarium. Intermarium simply means the land between the seas and refers to a Polish concept of the interwar period that um, was developed by, um, in some of the, above all in Poland, in some of the post-colonial um, countries of Eastern Europe after the breakup of the uh, major empires um, um, in connection after World War One, And the idea of the intermarium in the, in the interwar period was that you had um, uh, Germany in the West and Russia in or then the Soviet Union in the East, and that the um, uh, after World War One, these, these small nations, uh, they should unite and they should uh, form an alliance, a coalition, maybe even a federation in order to pre protect um, themselves from these uh, 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 from uh, German irredentism and, and, and Russian um, imperialism. Uh, as you know, these this uh, it's also called sometimes the Baltic Black Sea Alliance um, um, uh, did not materialize then, and uh, it did not, and, and World War II then happened and was not uh, prevented by such an. Alliance. Now, where there's a different situation, most of the countries that uh, in, in the interwar period uh, 
would have been part of the uh, Intermarium Alliance in uh, East Central Europe are now members of NATO and the European Union. But three, but three of them, uh, Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine are not. And that's why sort of this, this concept has, has uh, become uh, topical um, again. Um, the, um, uh, the intermarium would um, in today not only include these countries in the gray zone, but as I would think, the security uh, interests, the national interests of such countries as Poland, Romania, Slovakia, uh, and Hungary should be at least such that these countries would have an elementary national interest, for instance, in the stability and survival of the Ukrainian state. And they, um, I would think, um, in a way, they, they, sh they um, should therefore be interested in, in you know, supporting the uh, security of the Ukrainian state. Um, because the collapse, as I, as I outlined, that could happen in a, in a major escalation of the Ukrainian state would have also major repercussions for these neighboring countries of Ukraine. They could have large refugee uh, 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 waves uh, uh, in their countries. Uh, I already mentioned the nuclear power plant in, in Saporizhia and similar security risks. But this uh, alliance so far, uh, which I think would be the most natural alliance in a way, has not yet emerged because of what I would call the galactic or astronomic um, view of uh, many East European <laughs> diplomats and politicians on, um, on Eastern Europe, by which I mean that um, many of these politicians, they see Europe as consisting of two planets, the EU-NATO planet, which is the good planet, and, and the bad planet with all the rest. Yeah. So, and uh, um, the, the question is, however, and I've, I've, I've asked that rhetorically um, in, uh, sometimes in my, um, in my articles about that, what, what is it that NATO and the EU would do if the Ukrainian state collapses? You know, what, how would the NATO or the EU protect, let's say, Poland from the repercussions of an apocalyptic scenario in Ukraine a major war, a collapse of the state, millions of refugees. You know, would NATO shoot Ukrainian refugees? Or, you know, if there, if one of the four nuclear power plants explodes, would the EU, you know, introduce visas for nuclear particles from Saporizhia? Or what? Well, you know, this is these are sort of questions that one one asks, but unfortunately, this is not. Uh, so far um, much uh, on the agenda in uh, in countries like Romania and, and Poland. Yeah, so um, maybe the, um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave, I, I have now to sort of, so, some things I could say about what, what to do with, with this sort of um, dilemma that Ukraine and also Georgia and Moldova will be in for the next years, um, but maybe I'll leave that for the discussion so, uh, and won't take up much more time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my style has usually been to open the floor to discussion immediately, but uh, recently at our Ukrainian Research Center uh, Institute meetings, the chairman has taken the privilege of asking the first question. So I will uh, do that. And I will start, uh, you know, I will ask about the last scenario, which you have just outlined, uh, which uh, you say is. The, perhaps the most unlikely, but which is something that I and at least a small group of uh, people have been thinking about for a while. And it reoccurred uh, after, world, uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union briefly. Uh, Lech Walesa talked about it before the accession of Poland to the EU as, again, another uh, form for uh, Poland and Polish leadership to exert an influence in this uh, period. Now, among other difficulties with this scenario is the, uh, the changing character of the regimes in some of the countries that would be the potential members of this, Poland being uh, Hungary um, among them. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, those things also uh, change. You know, they go back and forth, and that is perhaps not a permanent change. A more interesting, I think, idea that has been circulating in this small group of people that have been discussing this is the adherence to this of Turkey. Hmm. And the you know, and what was missing perhaps from your presentation was the southern vector hmm. of Ukraine's uh, you know uh, international situation. 
And as we know, uh, at, again, at the present moment, there is a, shall we say, friendship or brotherhood between the pres President Erdogan and President Putin. Mm -hmm. But it's not that long ago, I think less than two years ago, that Putin said after the mm -hmm. shooting down of the Russian plane by the Turks, that never in history was, were Turkey and Russia friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think that, well, he may have exaggerated, but there's something to it. On the other hand, Ukraine and Turkey had been friends. That is forgotten. In uh, 1648, the Ottoman Empire recognized the Ukraine as a separate state after the revolution against uh, Poland. And there were many other you know, instances in the centuries intermixed, of course, with rather barbaric you know, confrontations. Um, so the last thing that I would add to this is the demographic factor. I did a little experiment and uh, using data uh, from 2011, because I did this a while ago, and that was what I had available. At that time, the uh, ratio of the population of Russia to the population of Turkey was two to one. It was 140 something million to 70 something million. However, if one looked at the age breakdown in the population then aged 15 and younger, which today would be about 20 and younger, the ratio of Russians and Turks was one to one. Mm -hmm. With the population of Russia, of course, being spread from the Baltic to the Pacific, and the Turkish population being concentrated in this uh, smaller mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood. So I wonder whether you could say something about, uh, you know, any thoughts you might have about mm -hmm. a revised intermarium idea, but even apart from that, about the potential role of Turkey in Ukraine's foreign uh, relations. Yeah, I mean, the, um, I think the reason we are discussing this here um, at all is I think that if you would know nothing about Eastern Europe and Russian history and so on, and, and you would simply look at the map, then, then this sort of alliance would be, and maybe there are some IR theorists here, would be the most natural thing. You know, you have a regional hegemon and there should be an alliance against the regional hegemon. Yeah? And that was the, also the, um, at least that's, you know, at least how I understand it. And, and there was this, as, as you mentioned, there was this before NATO offered, uh, uh, gave the Poland and, uh, and Hungary and um, the, the Czech Republic first and then other countries, uh, a NATO membership perspective, there was this idea of, it was called NATO bis, uh, the sort of, um, um, in sort of East European, Central East European yeah. NATO. And that was, that would have been then indeed the intermarium uh, implemented and uh, I think Alexander Motil has made this point that in a way the problem with NATO expansion was is it should have either not happened at all or it should have included all the countries in, in, in this gray zone and the problem is that it stopped halfway and that it sort of included some countries but left out others and these are now the, the countries that have lost their um, part of the territory that are, are partly pale states, uh, Moldova, um, Georgia, and, um, and Ukraine, and uh, Azerbaijan is also partly uh, a point here. Yeah, so the, um, I mean, there are also other issues, of course, with, with Poland and Hungary that I haven't, I haven't mentioned mm -hmm. here that they, um, uh, I think there's also something like strategic provincialism that we also have in Germany, that these countries, they, um, um, and I see that in Ukraine as well, and they look to Washington, and to Brussels, and they they try to hear what are people saying in Washington or in Brussels, and because nobody is there speaking of them making an, an alliance in Eastern Europe, they don't make an alliance because you know nobody told them to do so, you know that, and that's also how, how Germany largely functioned functioned at least until recently that they were looking what you know what people in Brussels and Washington are saying, and then we will do whatever they say. We will you know this is how how. Unfortunately, these uh, these uh, things function. Uh, yeah. Now about Turkey, um, um, I've actually um, I've, I've written about that, and I regret now having written about that when there was this half year when when there were these enormous uh, tensions between yeah. Turkey 
and and Russia when uh, when the um, the airplane was shot down and and it, and it looked like this will be go longer and um, you mentioned Alexander Dugin at the beginning there is a my, my suspicion is that Dugin may have played a role in this realignment um, between Turkey and at least there were some journalism reports uh, if somebody wants an interesting research project that would be something to explore who actually who actually you know organized this realignment between between Turkey and and Russia because it was really tense and then um, and then they suddenly became friends basically uh, Putin and, and Erdogan. I mean there was some natural affinity obviously between them um, but um, but it looked for a for a moment as this uh, would have as this was a, a window of opportunity for for Ukraine as well. I, I also published in, in in the Turkish Political Quarterly about this, and um, unfortunately, it hasn't uh, worked out. Um, I mean, the, the the interesting thing here about Turkey is that there are a number of structural issues in Turkish foreign policy that where, where Turkish foreign policy where one could argue that would sort of promote a Ukrainian-Turkish alliance. You know, the basically the interests concerning Crimea are very similar. You know, the um, the whole situation in the Black Sea, the Crimean Tatars um, that have become very pro-Ukrainian, and you know, there's a large Tatar minority in emigre community in uh, in Turkey. Um, there's the Turkish-Armenian issue. There is the, PK, uh, the, the, the PKK, the uh, Kurdish uh, uh, organization. Um, there, there are the differences be, um, between Turkey and Russia on, on Assad. There is competition between Turkey and, and Russia in Central Asia. And there is a, there's already a treaty between Turkey and Azerbaijan uh, from 2010, which is actually a quite uh, extraordinary treaty because it's a treaty of a of a NATO member country with a non-NATO member country about military aid. And, and of course, you know, it says that Azerbaijan and Turkey will help each other in the, in a, uh, in the case of an attack on, on one of these countries. But obviously, it's mainly a, a, a treaty about support of Turkey to Azerbaijan. So, so Turkey has already crossed this line with Azerbaijan. You know? so, so there's a whole number of factors that would actually uh, point in this direction, but right now, I think Russia has played this very well. Um, they, you know, with the with the gas and and uh, with this whole uh, relationship between Turkey, uh, between Erdogan and and Putin, and it's not uh, it's not on the agenda r right now. Right but now. maybe maybe mm -hmm. maybe there will be tensions again. And um, I think that's actually something that is well understood in Kiev. You know, that's and, that and is something that that people in uh, and again I would simply add the demographics you know, yeah. push things in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me start with the 